So this le lecture is uh, entitled The Morselation Debate. Uh, it's a lecture um, being prepared for the 8th of November 2016. Obviously, it may be out of date after this period. Um, I have disclosures in that I'm receiving hospitality from Gideon Richter tonight and have received so uh, on other days. Relevant to this topic, I have no other disclosures. And of course, uh, this uh, lecture could be called many things. It could be called Morselation Tribulation. It could be called Delirium in Brigham. Because this all came about after a operation that occurred in Brigham Women's Hospital on a lady called Amy Reed. She was a doctor, uh, and she was married to another doctor called Human. She had an unsuspected sarcoma, she had disseminated disease as a result of morselation, and this was brought to the attention of the world's press by her husband, and has resulted in a number of things and culminated in an FDA recommendation. And if you uh, 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 want to Google this and look this up on the uh, uh, internet, you'll see that there are many, many lawyers all prepared to uh, um, uh, speak to you if you've had a morselated sarcoma. But what do we need to know? We need to know what is the risk of sarcoma in a presumed fibroid. We need to know if there's a risk of non-on-block resection. We need to know if high-powered morselation does in fact increase the risk of dissemination and decrease your overall survival. And we need to know if there are any risks associated with morselation other than dissemination of disease. And can we modify our practice to reduce the risks? And I'm afraid the answer to all of these questions is that we just don't know the answer. And this is in the background of some very poor papers. Now, here is a paper, uh, and I apologise to this Korean group for criticising this paper, but I know they're, they're aware of the intrinsic faults in the paper itself. But... This is a paper heavily quoted, and uh, it's a paper that concludes that tumour morselation during surgery increased the rate of abdominal pelvic dissemination and adversely affected disease-free survival and overall survival in patients with apparently early uterine lyomyosarcoma. Well, this is a difficult paper to interpret anything from. When you read it, it's not clear how they determined in their retrospective series if um, morselation occurred. Uh, did they look at the histology? Did they look at the surgical notes? Or did they just guess on the procedure performed? And when you look at the procedures that were performed, and we'll see that there only are 56 patients in this total paper, we'll see that one group consisted completely of 31 women who'd had total abdominal hysterectomies, and the other group had a hotchpotch of procedures, including laparoscopic assisted vaginal hysterectomy, vaginal hysterectomy, a mini laparotomy after a myomectomy, and a laparoscopic myomectomy. And really, only one of those patients seems to have required morselation. And really, this is a paper of total abdominal hysterectomy against all other forms of surgery. And it's therefore not a morselation paper. And then when you look at it, you see that there are six patients in both groups who've had pelvic and periotic lymph node dissections. Well, who would do a periotic or uh, pelvic lymph node dissection if there wasn't a suspicion of cancer? It would be negligent to do one. So this is clearly not a group of women who have an inadvertent diagnosis of Lyomar sarcoma. Then we have to understand that uh, we can't really agree on pathology. So here is a uterus uh, that's been removed laparoscopically. And the gold standard to determine whether or not it, it has a Lyomar sarcoma is histopathology. But unfortunately, even they can't agree on what makes a sarcoma or not. And if you look at the World Health Organization criteria, we see that a Lyomar sarcoma can have two out of three of cytological atypia, increased mitotic activity of more than 10 per 10 high power fields, and tumor cell necrosis. Infarct necrosis does not count. And therefore, you can get many benign conditions that are misinterpreted as being lyomyomas sarcoma. So lyomyomas, or fibroids, benign tumors, can have cytological atypia. 
If they have cytological atypia, we call them lyomyomas with bizarre nuclei. Atypical lyomyoma was the old term, which we don't use anymore. Increased mitotic activity can occur still. It's called mitotically active lyomyomas. But if they don't have tumor cell necrosis and they don't have, or don't have cytological atypia, they are benign. Tumors with tumor cell necrosis and no other factors are called stumps or stromal tumors of uncertain malignant potential. And lyomyomas, which are very cellular, are called cellular lyomyomas. So, is there anything we can do to try and diagnose a sarcoma preoperatively? Well, um, uh, you can do uh, endometrial biopsies, and that is, uh, will pick it up probably over 80% of the case, but it's not always possible. You can do true cut or needle biopsies, but there's worries about malignant spread, errors of necrosis can be missed, sampling error can occur, and in one study the positive predictive value was only 58%. We can look at rapid growth on imaging, but it's non-specific. It's affected by GnRH analog usage. You can look at size, but it doesn't seem to matter. You can look at consistency. It doesn't seem to have any value. And you can look at uh, the number of fibroids. And again, this is not a marker. You can do MRIs, but uh, again, uh, it's not a good marker for uh, lyomyosarcoma. On ultrasound, you can look at increased peripheral and central vascularity, and that has a sensitivity of 100%, but a very low positive predictive value of 19%. On Doppler, you have decreased sensitivity, but increased positive predictive value. PET imaging can be performed. You can use alpha flora beta estradiol, which is thought to be better than FDG, but there's still no evidence for the routine use of this. CA125 is more likely to be raised in lyomyosarcoma, but it's non-specific. LDH and isoenzyme type 3 seems to be promising, but at the point of giving this lecture, there are only 10 lyomyosarcomas in small series. We at St. George's Hospital looked at our hospital codes and looked specifically for uh, fibroids using code the uh, OPCS code Q02.2. And we looked at that from 1st of June 2007 to the 31st of May 2014. And we also looked at our histological database for sarcomas of the uterus over a 14-year period. We found 867 fibroids removed at, at uh, a myomectomy. And we found 40 sarcomas. Of those 40 sarcomas, 22 were lyomyosarcomas, 13 were endometrial stromal sarcomas, and 5 were others. And we only found one sarcoma in a myomectomy specimen. And that patient was a 17-year-old girl with an endometrial stroma sarcoma stop. She had a true-cut biopsy which failed to give a diagnosis, and therefore she had a myomectomy in inverted commas because no one was going to hysterectomize a 17 year old girl without proper histology so in our series we found not a single sarcoma in 866 myomectomies so there's, there's a number of systematic reviews performed the European Society of Gynae Endoscopy performed a systematic review and that was published in this paper that showed a number of things and also looked at uh, a number of diagnostic techniques. And myself and Kevin Phillips uh, looked at the uh, incidence of uh, adverse pathology in uh, myomectomy uh, and hysterectomy for presumed fibroids. And overall, we found the risk to be 0.14%, that's 1 in 700, in papers with over 500 subjects. But the range was huge. One paper showed the risk to be 1 in 204, but of course that was actually a published abstract. It wasn't a peer-reviewed paper. And it, that went up to 1 in 1,788. And we found in that group that myomectomy patients had a much lower risk of a sarcomatous change compared to hysterectomy, and the reason for that was probably age. This is data from one paper that clearly demonstrates that the risk of lyomyosarcoma is considerably lower in the premenopausal group, and in fact almost non-existent. So our paper showed a risk of 1 in 700, or our analysis did, 
Yet the FDA reported the risk to be 1 in 350, and they concluded a review of published and unpublished scientific literature, including patients operated from 1980 to 2011, to estimate the prevalence of unsuspected uterine sarcoma and uterine lyomar sarcoma in patients undergoing hysterectomy or myomectomy for presumed fibroids. Well, this is a considerably different result to ours, and it may be uh, uh, that we looked at a different group of people. Pritz et al. makes this risk even lower, and considerably lower, one-tenth of what we found. And they looked at all randomised control studies looking at fibroids, and their technique probably is the better technique of analysing the risk of lyomar sarcoma in a final specimen. So we've already discovered that there are no good preoperative markers for uh, uh, lyomar sarcoma before surgery. And maybe this is why the FDA made its recommendations that laparoscopic power morcellators are contradicted for removal of uterine tissue containing suspected fibroids in patients who are peri- or post-operative or postmenopausal, or are cannons for on block tissue uh, removal, for example through the vagina or mini laparotomy incisions. And then it says that, note, these groups of women represent the majority of women with fibroids who undergo hysterectomy and myomectomy. They then went on to say that laparoscopic power morcellators are contraindicated in gynecological surgery in which the tissue to be morcellated is known or suspected to contain malignancy, and no one really disputes that last statement. But then... Rather contradictory to their initial statement, the FDA allows marketing of the first-of-a-kind tissue contain containment system for use with certain laparoscopic power morcellators in selected patients. But of course it then goes on to say that the agency continues to warn against the use of laparoscopic power morcellators for removal of uterus or uterine fibroids in the vast majority of women. The, the problem with these recommendations is there is actually a wealth of resource concerning laparoscopic myomectomy from randomised control studies. There's a Cochrane review, and this Cochrane review shows potentially less post-operative pain at 24 hours, shows less post-operative pain at 48 hours, and less post-operative fever. These are significant results, which clearly demonstrate that there is an advantage for laparoscopic myomectomy over open myomectomy. The only issue with laparoscopic myomectomy is morcellation, and it seems that the risk of lyomyosarcoma inadvertently being diagnosed at laparoscopic morcellation is minimal, certainly less than 1,300 from our meta-analysis and probably lower than that than Pritz meta-analysis. And bearing in mind these, these women are women who are um, premenopausal, the risk is even lower. So we would advocate proper information to patients, proper information regarding the debate, but I would not say that morcellation is contraindicated. And in fact, I would say it should continue to be used. And we now have in-bag morcellation devices that contain specimens even if there is a sarcoma. Many thanks.